Welcome to Series 2, Episode 4 of Run With. Today I talk to Kimberly Clark, otherwise known as Track Club Babe. Kimberly is an amazingly accomplished runner and she has brought her marathon time down from 6 hours and 8 minutes to an impressive 3 hours 11 minutes. Today she talks to me all about her experiences, the ups and the downs of marathon training and lessons that she has learned along the way. Kimberly is incredibly passionate about running and also dreaming big and you will find her on social media encouraging others to dream big. So hello and welcome to Run With. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you, Kim. I've got so much that I want to talk to you about because um, I, I love everything about you from what you've achieved with your marathon to your social media, but we will get to all of that and we will cover all of those bases. Um, so first of all, shall we just delve in a little bit into your running history? How did you begin? Sure. So I... I guess like the really long short answer would be my dad was a runner when he was in high school. He had done three marathons by the time he was 12. And so, and his fastest was 307. And he retired running in high school. So he never ran again, but because I knew about it, I was like, I mean, I'm probably gonna be an amazing runner. <laughs> like in my mind, like I was supposed to be a good runner. And I thought like, since he didn't have sons that I would like run to like make him really proud. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And then in high school, I finally did it my senior year. I ran for one year in high school, but I was terrible. So I was like, well, I guess I was wrong and it's gifted me. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally, the only reason I was running was to like, you know, make him proud. And just because it, I thought it would be like in my jeans. And then I was so bad at it. and was like so embarrassed that I was like, you are never allowed to come to any of my meets. So I like forbade him and my mom from ever watching me run. I'm like, it's pitiful. You cannot come. So they never came and watched me run because I like made them not. And then I retired from running after that one year of running in high school. Uh, but I did run a marathon at the end of that year. Like, so I just, yeah, I, a guy in my class told me I could never run one. I was like, well, I'm going to run one in college. He's like, you couldn't. So I was like, okay. And there was one that weekend. So I went and signed up and I ran it and it was painful, but I did it. <laughs> and then I really retired from running then and then picked it up again at 29 to run another marathon. Um, okay. A couple of things there. I cannot believe that your dad ran three marathons at that age. I mean, no, in this day and age, I mean, no, you, you can't, you can't run marathons. Let them, yeah. you know, but I mean, yeah. A three hour marathon. Yeah, That's pretty lovely. amazing. So, and they were like doing it on in the winter in Wisconsin, like not like on maybe like 50 training miles. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, no wonder you were inspired by that to try and, and start running. Yeah. Um, and your first marathon, yes, that must have hurt. Anybody that's done a marathon with little training knows how much it hurts, let alone with no training. But yeah. I love that you went and just had a go at it because somebody told you that you couldn't do it. Yeah, that just shows <laughs> I was so young. So I just like didn't even realize what a marathon would entail. So I'm like, I mean, how hard could it be? <laughs> yeah, how hard it be? but that first marathon was 6.08, right? Yes, yes, yeah. good memory. Um, yeah. So 10 years passes. Um, mm -hmm. and you, you don't do running in that time. Anything, nothing. <laughs> nothing, you completely drop it. Were you, were you really scarred from the marathon? Yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, I lost. Okay, so I wore two pair of cotton socks and shoes that were too small because my feet are so big. Uh, and so I was trying to like disguise my big feet. <laughs> so by, by mile 14, my whole, like every part of my foot on both of my feet were covered in blisters. Oh. So I had to like, pull over, take one of my cotton socks off, you know, because I had two pairs and then keep going. So then like my whole feet were like covered in blisters because it was a really hot summer San Diego day. And then I'm like overdressing. And then my, I lost half of my toenails um, from the marathon. And I was just like on, it was my graduation week, week from high school. So there's all these different ceremonies and awards and everything. I was like unable to walk. So like anytime I got called up for an award, everybody would just start laughing as I started to walk because I could like barely walk. And I'm like, I was so, I mean, I was completely out of shape going into the race. I got totally decimated during the race. And then the aftercare after the race was like, I mean, I was a mess, you know? So I was definitely like, okay, I did it. <laughs> I bucket list did it and I'm done. <laughs> but done, that's it, that's you done. But it isn't you done because marathons are now your 
thing oh, for distance. Yeah. So after 10 years, you come back. Why did you come back and start running then? Yeah, so I my, my cousin somehow got into running again. She got on a running team and, um, and, and signed up for the LA Marathon. And she looked great. And I'm like, I mean, I've always wanted a redemption race, you know? So I thought that that would be really cool to do the same marathon I had done, but, you know, years later. So I was like, I might as well, you know? And so I just... My idea was like, I want to do like a little bit better than 608, you know, so anything is, you know, anything that I can improve off of that would be a win, you know, um, because I had just never had the ability to train for one before. So, um, so I just decided, you know, I'm just going to do another one to like, it's going to be my redemption race and I'll be done. And then I got super sucked in <laughs> and I'm still here. So <laughs> yeah. So the first one I was just like, I mean, I was asking like one of my best friends who had run a marathon before and I'm like, so is it too lofty of a goal to think of doing like 10 minute miles for every single mile of the marathon? She's like, I don't know, but I think you could do it. So I'm like, okay. So that was like my goal going into the first one. And then I did, I don't know what I even did. I did 401. So I, I'm not, maybe that's like an 845 or an 850 pace, maybe nine pace. Low, low, I'm not um, low nine, sure. Yeah, yeah. But that's a lot faster than that. What it is, sorry, a minute per mile. <laughs> yeah, so I, I I beat that goal, so that was pretty cool. So and then I was like, oh, I wonder what more I could do. <laughs> and so that just has kept me really excited about it. It's just such a fun journey. Yeah, yeah, and you've been on an amazing journey with the marathon, and I, I think it's fair to say that you've had good highs and you've had the lows as well. Which yeah. is super lows. <laughs> you have got you have kind of been there and done that which is why I you know I really want to talk to you because you've got the knowledge from going through it yourself yes definitely. so talk to me then about your journey from you've done your four hour ish marathon and then you decide that you quite like the marathon now it's not completely <laughs> ruining you like the first yeah. one so yeah. what was the next goal after that so um I, so our, I, I like joined like a track club here in San Diego and they like paired you up with somebody, um, like a mentor. And so that was really cool. Like, and so I like thought of my mentor as like the end all be all. And she was wonderful and so helpful, but she like walk ran her marathons. Mm -hmm. So when she saw what I was like doing, what I did in LA and that we kind of, I ended up blowing my goal out of the water, you know? She was like, I need to pass you along to somebody else because they can help you more. You know, like, I think you should be like aiming for qualifying for Boston one day, you know? And I don't think that like, I'm a great mentor for like beginner runners, but you need somebody who's able to help hone you in on what you want to do. So I was like, oh, okay. You know? And so I, I linked up with our, our Boston coach locally. And, um, and, you know, I kept, I think the next marathon was like a three, 351 and then the next one was a 342 at the end of that year so within nine months I went from like a 401 to a 342 but I also you know I was still figuring everything out and I was trusting somebody else's training which he was wonderful but by the by the end of my first year of running I was doing 70 miles of, of running a week and that's a lot which is totally it's totally unnecessary for for that time goal mm. you know and but I didn't know any better. And so even like my half marathon, like, you know, my half marathon um, kind of predictor race a couple of weeks out from my last marathon of the year, I just totally bombed it because I was so fatigued. And, um, and I think it was just too much for me. So like, I think that even if I had pulled the reins back my first year, I would have gone even faster because for me, heavier mileage doesn't help me out as much. And I mean, to go from completely inactive, like my whole life, basically to running 70 mile weeks within the first year, mm -hmm. I just think it's like too, too much too soon, you know? So, but because everyone around me, I was seeing like, like high mileage, high mileage, high mileage, you know, whether it's um, the people in my club, whether it's the bloggers I like to follow, I'm, I was like only seeing one messaging. Yeah. And so I was like full force in that direction because that's what I thought would get me to my goal. And it really tired me out and probably put, like pushed me back from my goal. Like um, it like held me back longer from reaching my potential. Cause I didn't, I didn't know that there was another way to get fast besides lots and lots and lots of miles. 
Yeah, and I mean, there is that message which kind of drummed home to a lot of runners that the more miles you run, the faster you become. Um, the best way to improve your running is to run. Um, yeah. But obviously you were quite new to it and you haven't had that chance to build up the impact on your body or to, yeah. adjust to any kind of mileage. That's quite exactly. you know, kind of going in at the deep end. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, here, I'm just trying to swim and we're just like overloading me too much at first, you know? And um, so, so now I know that for my body, I do better with less miles, higher quality miles and just a lot of speed. And that makes it all so much more fun too. So when you, um, when did you hit your 311? So I did that. So I, I, you know, after I hit that, um, 342, my first year, I, I ended up running a Boston qualifier, maybe a year later. I, um, I ran like a 328. So that was like, I was on cloud nine, like, you know, that's, like it, that's a huge goal for so many people. Yeah. It, I was just like, Oh my gosh, like I did it. Like I believed in myself. I did it. Um, it was such a huge, like it was a huge goal of mine. And then it just helped me feel really confident and believe in myself. So I just started seeing this like unlimited potential, you know, because I'm like hitting this new big goal. And so I was like really confident after that and really excited about running. And then I got back into that mileage trap and then that literally like ruined my running, you know? So I, like, I saw all this potential and then I got over super overtrained. I was doing um, 80 mile weeks in training for Boston. And I think I ran like a 348 maybe at Boston, maybe 349. I'm like so bad at remembering my times exactly, but um, I might've ran a 350, but I ran in that range and which was completely devastating. You know, I was aiming for like low 320s and I ran 19 minutes off of my PR that day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just completely, completely devastated, shocked. I had no idea it was coming, you know, like, I, now I know my body so well, so I can see all the warning signs, but it was like hilarious because there's a hundred warning signs leading up to Boston, but because I didn't see them on the day of Boston, I was like, I'm totally in shock. What is going on? You know, like now I'd be like, hello, <laughs> there's all these things, but I was just like, so emotionally broken over Boston, just that this huge goal I had done like horribly, um, at, and, um, and then I was just back at it. I have to redeem myself. You know, I'm going to go run Berlin and I'm going to run an amazing time, still overtraining. <laughs> and I, or at that point, I'm basically trying to come back from overtraining and probably still doing too much. And then I, you know, ran 339 and then I ran Tokyo the next February, 338. So here I had run a 328, you know, a year or two before. And now I'm just still like so far from even where I was mm -hmm. and just like totally unsure of like, I mean, I was just, I wanted so badly to get better and I just had no idea what to be doing. And I was doing a lot of things, but they weren't the right things. And so, I guess in your head, you're thinking you're putting all these miles in that 70 miles worked before and you got the 328. So, you know, you're putting in 80 mile weeks now. So why yeah. aren't you, you getting yeah. faster? I thought it was like a magical equation. Like the more miles you put in, the faster you yeah. are automatically. Like it's just, and it doesn't even matter what those miles look like or what the training is feeling like while you're doing those miles. But if you do the miles, then you get faster. But like, if you're totally exhausted, barely sleeping during it, like if all of your workouts during that time are getting slower and slower, like you're, it's not gonna automatically equal PR, you know? Like you have to be feeling good in training and you can have some off days, but like all of training shouldn't be like a suffer fest, mm -hmm. you know? And so I just, didn't even know before about how to listen to my body or like how to receive the signs it was telling me and actually like change things and adapt for it. So then once I like kind of, you know, I just didn't hear a lot of people talking about less miles and just like faster miles back then. And so I just, I had to kind of like figure it out for myself at that point and just like really take a step back. I stepped down to five days of running a week from like, you know, seven and I was doing like doubles and seven days of running a week. So then I just did five times of running a week, five days a week. And, um, and then I started doing just shorter speed workouts. I'm like, I have to start getting fast. Like, and the only way to get fast is by like cultivating my speed. And so I went, I think eight months with my longest interval being one mile. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, doing long tempo work. I wasn't, um, I wasn't even doing long, long runs. Like my longest run was like 12 or 13 miles maybe, but I 
basically seriously um, dialed down my mileage, my the amount of running I was doing a week, and just like was focusing on like feeling good and feeling powerful on my runs. And um, then when I went back to the marathon at the end of that year, I ran a 311 easily. Mm -hmm. Like it was the most relaxed, magical day ever. And it was because I gave my body the rest it needed, like dialed back the training and then really focused on honing in on speed. So that way the marathon felt so relaxed and comfortable. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think, what, what was the turning point for you when you realized that you were doing too much, that you, you were suffering from overtraining? I mean, the times were the, the, <laughs> the first thing I like, they were the, my first wake up call. Like I'm, I'm serious. I had no idea before Boston that I was going to run that far off of my goal because mm. I had, I was so green to running. I could not recognize all the signs as they were hitting me on the head, you know? And so me getting that time at Boston that like a 348 or something me getting that time was like well something I'm doing is not working clearly yeah. <laughs> you know it's not it doesn't take a rocket science just to realize that running half an hour off of my goal that I need to change something you know so that was honestly the biggest thing and then just seeing that that kind of same mentality with training wasn't improving me that much I mean I did 339 and 338 still 10 minutes off of my PR and so I really had to figure out what worked best for me and my body. And, and it wasn't obviously what had been working for other people in the club or people I was seeing online. Like it didn't matter what they were doing if I couldn't do it, you know? So um, I, I think that just figuring out that less running worked better for me and then just like faster running. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so more quality over quantity. Yeah. It's um, it made me feel a lot more confident. It, helped me to just find new speed that I never had before, you know, cause it wasn't like I had this speed and now I'm like trying to find it again. Like I never trained like this, you know, I never trained for speed. I never trained to like be fast and not like marathon fast, but just be like quick, you know? And so, um, when, when you bring down, like when you're a lot faster then marathon pace feels a lot slower yeah. and and I didn't even realize that that's what I was doing at that point. I just kind of needed a change and I just needed to feel confident and excited about my running again um, because I had been so like emotionally beat down by running, which is like totally silly. But, you know, if you love something so much and then you like initially get really positive feedback and affirmation from it and you're like, oh my gosh, this is like, it's becoming part of your identity. And then it turns around and it like beats you up and you're just like, I am the worst runner ever. You know, I was like, so ashamed of like my times, you know, I, when I was performing poorly and now I really wouldn't care. I like, I'm in such a different place now, but back then it was just, it was who all my friends were. I just felt like they probably like looked down on me as a runner. And it was probably mostly in my head, but it just shows you like what type of space I was in at that point that I had to like really have like a mental shift and stop feeling like I was like losing constantly and failing constantly. So that way, once I got my confidence back, then it made it all more fun. I was able to take more chances and to be excited about my running. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we can all fall into that trap a little bit, or we have fallen into that trap. I know I've been in there thinking I'm not a real runner, you know, the, the, the classic, I'm not a real yeah. runner, I'm not fast enough, I'm not doing this right. And I do think that um, by thinking that way, I think it's quite detrimental to your training anyway, because as yeah. soon as those negative thoughts come in, then why are you, why are you doing it? You know, yeah. it's, I mean, why are we going into this if we're not a hundred percent mentally in, you know, and I, I just didn't get that during my, like I had like a two period of like two years of total reg regression. And during that time, I was still doing all the physical, practical running things, but my mind was just so out of it. Like it was, I wanted to be in it, but I was, I mean, I would cry before workouts because I was so nervous about failing, you know, it was just like, I was just in a total like loser mentality mm. and it totally sabotaged me. You know, I, I isolated myself from the running community. I wouldn't do any workouts with people because I was so embarrassed about how slow I was. I mean, just like, it's just so many red flags of how I was handling something mentally and being that um, emotionally beat down by running kept me 
physically from being able to reach my goals as well. You know, so you can't think that you're going to reach these goals if you're, if your mind isn't on board, you know, and I was so, I wasn't trying to be negative. I was just so discouraged and disappointed, mm -hmm. you know, so I really had to figure out a way to shift that. And I had to first um, see my mind shift before my results could shift. And that was like a huge turning point for me in starting to believe again that I was fast, that I had potential, that I was going to reach my goals. You know, like I had to first start believing that again, because I had spent so long just like just being so tough on myself, you know, and it didn't get me anywhere. <laughs> I just stayed in a negative spot. It kept me not running with people. It kept me not taking chances and being scared all the time. So it was just, um, yeah, a place I will never go back to now because I'm like so much after having gone through that, I just know so much more about the mental side of running and just how that controls everything. Yeah, absolutely. And you talk about it a lot on your social media, on your Instagram posts. I absolutely love your Instagram posts because you kind of say what we're all thinking or what, you know, you say it how it is. <laughs> you know that. I'm like, if I put it out there first, then you could admit that you're thinking it too. <laughs> every, every post you put up, I'm like, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> no problem, brand. Like the other day, actually following on from what you just said about dreaming big. Um, and I thought that was a really poignant post and you yeah. said dream big, you like go for it. Yeah. I mean, why are we just watching somebody else dream big and like seeing them do it when we have the same time, we can do it too. You know, it's like we, we overestimate everybody else's ability and underestimate ours. Mm -hmm. And that should be the case, you know, like now I feel like I'm delusionally confident. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I mean, but like, and that's kind of how you have to be, especially when you've been in a tough spot with your running or whatever, you need to find some delusional confidence. You honestly do, because it's what turns things around before you actually see a real change. And, um, and it makes life a little bit easier too. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. I've set a crazy, crazy big goal for this year. No, it's not crazy. It's I'm not just like, crazy. You know, I'm like, you know what? Is that that? I'm doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time um I think I'm quite aware now of I mean I've been very injury prone kind of just I, I see something and I go for it and I don't yeah. necessarily think about it too much and then I end yeah. up broken and so I've got to be a bit careful about it and not go you know too too yeah. silly yeah I think, I think you can go quite hard but be sensible I think you can too I mean when I, I think you can train for a BQ at like 40 miles a week, 40. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need to hit more than that. Yeah. I mean, and, and you could probably hit even less. Um, but like, I don't think it has to be totally crazy. I think that any good training has you like totally listening to your body. So if something is feeling off, you back off like immediately, you know? And so that's what I try to say in my Instagram post, just in general, is just like, our body feedback is the most important thing to listen to in training. Like nothing else matters more than that because your body is telling you the signs before it's too late, you know? And so just, um, you know, I didn't know how to listen to them before for my overtraining, you know? And I, and when I was in high school, I did the same thing with shin splints. You know, I had stress fractures in my shins. So like, you know, it's giving you signs before we're over the cliff, but it's just like learning how to listen to them. And, and, and also just like being okay with pulling back if we need to during training. Cause it's, not like all is lost. It's more like, Hey, if I pull back a little bit, if I adjust things, like I'll be able to hop back into it in like a week or two, you know? Yeah. A more sensible, not like, uh, like all or nothing approach to training, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that when you've been through those experiences, it, 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 it teaches you something and that's a positive because you know, not to do it again, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I can't, I can't run high mileage. I break. So I have to rely on cross training. I have to do my strength yeah. I have to do other things to yeah. get my body going. But if I start doing high mileage and high mileage for me might be 50 miles a week. If I start doing 50 miles a week, I start breaking down. So I've got to be really careful. Yeah. The majority of people have. Um, and I think especially like where you came into the marathon 10 years after doing your first when you had that big break and you went straight into distance running yeah um I think especially kind of 
that's the same as what I did. I kind of went yeah. straight into distance running. But when totally. you spent that time building up the 5K, the 10K, the half marathon, kind of going yeah. through the shorter distances, you yeah. have got to be a little bit careful. Yeah, it's like uh, all of us as like an adult, as adult runners are like coming in, like lured in by the marathon or maybe the half marathon. And so like, we're all like not developing in the proper way. And most people have never focused on speed where like every single pro runner spent all of high school, all of college doing 5k and under, you know? And so, and here we are like old, you know, coming in older (laughs) and we're like, and let's do a lot of miles. Like we have no base from like, you know, childhood, high school, college on, but why don't we just start with miles? (laughs) Go big or go home. (laughs) How could this have any problems, you know? And so then, then we're like all these like older injured marathon runners. (laughs) I know, I know it is crazy. Um, so do you think you've got the balance with training right now, or do you think there's still something that you can improve on? Well, so I am just now coming back into training again after and I tell season. you as well sorry to interrupt you there but I love 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 you've been sharing coming back and you've been sharing where you are now and that's perfectly fine and you've been showing kind of your time per mile and yeah. obviously it's a lot slower than what you would have been doing training for a 311 marathon but you've been very yeah. open about like this is where I am now and that's okay yeah and yeah, yeah so I mean that's the thing I don't care like I, I feel like <laughs> when I got into running that I would just see everybody posting paces and everybody wanted to be like having like a cute pace. Mm -hmm. And I realized the paces like don't matter. So I don't mind putting out there and I'd rather put it out there so that it validates other people so that they see my 1150 paced 1150 minutes per mile. Cause I know you guys are kilometers. Um, so that's like even no, 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 I'm, I'm miles. Miles are good. <laughs> okay. Miles, okay. Um, but yeah, so, you know, they'll see my 11.50 to be like, Oh, okay. Well then mine is fine too. But even when I was training for my 3.11 marathon, I promise you every single easy run was done at 10 to 12 minute pace. So all, all of my easy runs for my 3.11 were done 10 to 12 minute pace on the treadmill. Cause I loved the treadmill back then. And, um, and then I did my speed workouts, you know, five to six minute pace. Yeah. But, but, you know, so your easy runs can literally be whatever pace they need to be for you to recover. And right now they're 10 to, they're 10 to 12 minute pace because I'm out of shape. <laughs> but even when I was in shape, because I was trying to recover harder, I would run them super slow and I didn't care, you know, so they would take me forever. But, um, but I, I got to the start line injury free and ran an easy, easy 311, you know, so I was in great aerobic shape. Yeah, so um, I do want to go back to that about easy runs, but at the moment then, so you're just building up coming back from injury. Well, so I'm, I'm coming back from like health issues. So like, I mean, it's been like a really weird two years, but basically before my last, uh, my last marathon in 2018 or 19, um, it's hard to, okay, 20 was last year. So I think it was in 2019. Maybe yeah. it's 2008. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I'm like, cannot remember right now. But so basically two years ago, um, I got sick in the middle of marathon training and I was like running my fastest I've ever run, like, like out of my mind fast. And I was so excited. And then um, I just couldn't kick the sickness I had during the training block. And I would take days off. I would move runs. It just was not, it, I couldn't kick it. And so I was almost going to pull out from the race. But then I was like, well, I've trained so hard. Like, let's see if I can, like, what can happen? So I had a bust of a race. It was horrible. And, um, I couldn't even hold, um, uh, my marathon pace for like a mile or two miles going downhill. Um, so I ran, I ran a 319, which is still like my second fastest marathon ever, but I was supposed to be running like under three, you know? So it was, I was just basically jogging into the finish line. Like it was my husband dropped out of that race. We both had horrible races. Um, and then the year before he qualified for the Olympic trials and I ran a 3.11. So we both had like magical races. So that was 2017. And then 2018, we both had really, really hard um, races. Mm-hmm. And um, so then after that, I thought, okay, I'll take a couple weeks off and I'll be like hundred percent. And it wasn't like that at all. I have been dealing with like different health issues since, since then. So I finally gotten better this last year. It literally took me like two years. I had like um, just like really serious immune stuff going on during that time. And then just, I found out I was hypothyroid and 
all these different things all at once. So now I'm finally feeling good. So I'm like, I'm going to start training again. I'm just going to start really light. Um, but I, I also just want to put the message out there. If you're not feeling well, take the time off. It's okay. Like you can come back, you'll get back to where you were, like be confident enough to do what you need to do for your body, just because that's always, always, always the right call. But, um, so, so I took seven months off from running entirely. Mm -hmm. So I didn't any cardio during that time because I was just trying to let my body heal. And, um, so I like, yeah, so I'm totally out of shape now, <laughs> but I don't care. I'm getting to run again and it's feeling easy again. And I'm putting my paces up there. So that way when other people are coming back or just as they're running, they can say like, oh, okay, like it's not a big deal to be running that pace. Like who cares? You know? So I just want to normalize actually easy paces so that way other people can feel confident about them because when I was doing this before, I really didn't see like people posting their slow runs, you know, um, or like people who I thought were quick posting like more relaxed, easy runs. Yeah, sure. I, and I, do, do you think that social media has a big part to play in that? That the fact that yeah. people don't go easy enough? I think so. I mean, I, I, that's why I say like, if you are, if you're so like committed to like posting your paces, then stop doing that. So that way you don't have to care what you're running or don't wear a watch, you know, because it's these like arbitrary things that don't matter that people are more focused on than actually recovering their body. So yeah. your only goal in running easy is to allow your body to recover and to get that aerobic work in. It's not to um, put your body further into the well as it's already trying to come back up from your last speed training session. And I see people and I'll see their heart rate and it's like 180 on an easy run or 170 on an easy run. I'm like, that's not easy. No. You know, no. like, um, but you know, I think, I, I think that social media makes it harder. And then I think there, there's another thing too, where even social media wasn't around in your mind, you think if I'm not running fast on my easy days, how am I going to improve? Yeah. And I'll have people message me and saying like, how do I get my easy pace to drop? Mm. And I'm like, that should be the focus. Mm. The focus should be on how can I get faster on my fast days? Because who cares what happens on your easy days? Your easy days are for you to recover, you know? So they could look, they look all like totally different based on how your body was handling the speed days. But I have so many people that are always like, what do I do to improve my paces on my, you know, on my everyday run? And I'm like, no, let's just focus on getting you fast. And working on your speed i absolutely agree with that i get messages all the time saying to me what's your easy pace how can i lower my easy pace yeah and my response is always the same my easy pace is mine um, yeah it varies hugely depending on if i'm tired you know if i'm yeah. tired, if what terrain i'm running on what the weather conditions are like mm -hmm. i just go off my heart rate so i will not yeah. go above that easy heart rate which again is individual to each person totally and I mean, that is heart rate is telling you if it, if it's in the 160s or 170s, that's not going to be easy, you know, and, and we're so focused on what's an easy pace and what it looks like, instead of saying like, what's your body actually telling you, you know, because that's the only thing that matters in training is how is your body handling the work, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then it just leaves you, if you're doing easy, right, it leaves you fresh. It leaves you ready to go and smash the speed sessions or the first yeah. one and you feel better for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't come back up to the top if you're just so drained from your easy days. And so I just let myself do whatever they need, you know, I, whatever I need to do for an easy day. And that way I can like feel like ready to go for my speed days. And that's why I also take off an additional two days of running a week, you know? So I'm just like building in different systems. So I'm protecting myself from ever overtraining again, mm -hmm. you know? So like my five days of running a week is to guard against that. My super easy runs where I'm not even wearing a watch. Like I don't wear a watch anymore for, for easy runs. I just a hundred percent go by how my body feels. All those things are just to be like, just like tuned into my body and not focused on data. That's going to actually sabotage me because the data is helping people to get better. It's getting them so focused on arbitrary numbers that it's going to sabotage their training in the long run because they're, they're looking at data over the listening to the body. Mm, absolutely I completely agree with you with that one um I wanted to touch upon as well you're very um it's some of your posts again like I said are you know like yep yeah, yep yeah, yep yeah. you did an interesting one the other day as well and I think this can um lead to fatigue and breaking down but you were talking about fueling for running and for women specifically yeah and I think you said in your post what was it recommended for I saw 450 calories or something 
1450 um, calories. It was like a major influencer with like 1.4 million followers saying like, she was like trying to show like, this is what you could eat for 1450 calories. It was like some like, um, you know, maybe like a coffee and a donut. And she's like, or a full day of eating equals 1450 calories. And it was like, basically just like fruits and vegetables, which are great. But like, there's no, there was, there was not a lot of carbs in there. It was just, there was no protein in there, you know? So um, it really made me concerned seeing that because people, this is going out on the internet to a lot of people and women are seeing this and we are starving ourselves. We are over-exercising. And then we're wondering why is my body a mess? You yeah. know, and that it makes me really upset just seeing um, just such low calories be promoted as like the way to health when that's, that's going to, that can seriously mess up your body. And if, if your whole goal is performance anyways, this is not going to help you perform better, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You're not going to have the fuel to yeah. do the workouts. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, that, that's just like another tough thing to be seeing in the industry is just different, you know, whether it's um, a food tracking app that's suggesting that you eat such low calories for such, you know, for a lot of um, energy, um, like for expending a lot of energy, like all those different things are the messaging that we as women have been receiving for years saying, eat less, exercise more. That's what you need to be doing. You know, when that's not how to perform better, it's not how to feel better. It's not how to have your hormones in balance. It's not like, it's not what we need to be doing. And, um, and that's not even probably going to make you skinnier in the long run, if that's what you wanted anyways, because it's going to totally mess your metabolism up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, um, I know from personal experience that times where I've had stress fractures have been when I've been in a calorie deficit. Um, yeah. And then Cal Capris, I'm running all the, all the miles and you know things start breaking down. You need the fuel, you need the nutrients, you need the vitamins, you need all yeah. of that, that good calories in you. And I say good calories. I do like donuts. Don't, donuts do uh, <laughs> feature a lot. Yeah, they can get a little extra calories in there too for you. Winter comfort. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's so important. And I think it's so important for people, you know, like like yourself, where lots of women look up to you and they follow your journey to speak out about it and say, yeah. you know, no, do not do that. This is the correct way to feel to train. Yeah, that's that's how I feel too. Just um you know, cause I feel like I, I've seen a lot of messaging from people who had big platforms and it was just, you know, messaging I was seeing and hearing and reading when I was very impressionable and so desperately wanted to get better and faster. And the messaging was do, you know, five fitness classes a day, do more miles, eat less, eat super, super duper clean. And I mean, I eat very healthy, but I'm eating a lot of food, you know, and um, and I still have treats. I had ice cream last night and, you know, but the point being like, I think we need more women out there talking about food and talking about, um, about this issue we're having with under eating, especially in, um, in running, you know, it, uh, missing periods and that not being okay. It's being, a, it's a warning sign. Like we need to be talking more about these things because when we don't talk about them, we're allowing, um, disordered thinking to, hide in this sport mm. you know and that's what is worrisome to me and now you know being an older runner um i just like want to make sure that that messaging is coming across louder and loud and clear to our younger runners you know because i don't want in high school girls to be thinking that they need to be eating less and their body needs to look a certain way and they need to be running more miles and then they don't have their period they're getting stress fractures they're <laughs> getting depressed because their running is going poorly but like just trying to make the messaging be loud and clear. Like you honor your body, you put it first, you do right by it and everything will work out. Like you'll be able to hit your potential that way, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, and I love that you're sharing that. And I think, I feel like it's very important to you to be sharing these positive messages. And like I said yeah. before, you, you've kind of, you've you've had the ups and downs of training, of marathon yeah. training, of going through all of, all of those experiences. So you're in a, a brilliant position to be able to say, you know, look, I've been through this or I've been through that. So I am, I do know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to talk having gone through all of that and then, you know, made 
made a recovery and then figured out what, what helps me to actually thrive. And so, you know, seeing a lot of harmful messaging out there, I want, you know, I'm grateful to have this platform. I better be using it in a helpful way, you know? So for me, addressing things like women running without a period or under eating in the sport and it being hidden because we're over exercising. So it does it, does it really look like under eating if it's still like 15 or 1600 calories? Well, you're running 15 miles that day. So you should have been eating more, you know? So different things like that, that I think are really important to be addressing because, um, you know, we want everybody to be thriving in the sport. We don't want it to be like you run for a little while and then it wears you down so much and your health is in such a mess that you can't do it anymore, you know? So we wanna be doing this for forever. So how can we make this the most sustainable and a really like joyful journey? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Okay, right. So we've talked about big goals. So what motivates you to keep improving, to keep setting big goals? Yeah, I mean, I think that my big goals motivate me to keep going. I mean, I'm not done, you know, so that's how I feel about it. Um, I just have such big goals for the marathon. And and so even like I had like this longest health struggle this time in like two years, and it's been so long and not a lot of like positive physical feedback during that time, you know, just the fact that I literally had to take seven months off from running. But like the difference between this time and my two years of regression before, um, where, you know, after, you know, like where I was running like the Boston marathon and all those races slow, the difference between those two times is that this time I like totally believe in my potential. I am like so confident. And so I don't like, I don't think like, oh my gosh, all my dreams are down the tubes. I'm like, can't wait to get healthy again. Cause I'm going to crush it, <laughs> you know? Oh Yeah. It's just, I am in such a different space. I, even during the time I wasn't running, I was still so positive about everything because I just know that once my body gets healthy, that I'll be back on top. And it's just a matter of giving my body what it needs to get there. And so my really big goals in the marathon keep me really engaged on just doing everything I can to get my body like back to a hundred percent. But this time around, I'm like, I'm like so much more, I'm like, so much more positive and excited. And it's, I'm not concerned about where I am. And I could say like, oh my God, you just ran two miles, 11.53 pace. You think you're really gonna run a sub three marathon anytime soon? You know, I don't say that to myself because I'm like, well, that's unproductive. And two, I have to run easy to get my aerobic fitness back. So it's all gonna work out. So um, just having like a lot more confidence in myself and because I know how fast fitness can build once I'm like back in the swing of things. So, um, so yeah, so I have some big goals in the marathon. I definitely want to go sub three and then one day much bigger, but you know, have to do that sub three first, but, um, but yeah, so that keeps me really excited. And, and I, and then I set smaller goals, um, like in different distances too. So like one day I'd love to like run a really fast mile. <laughs> Really fast mile. What do, what do you think you could do if you trained? If you trained specifically for a mile, what do you think you could do? What would oh you God. Think you do? I honestly think of like all the distances that the mile would probably be my strong suit. Like if, like I have a lot of raw speed, but I didn't even know that until I started training for speed. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, I would love to break five minutes in the mile one day. Like that'd be so fun. Um, and I'm like nowhere close to that. In training, I did um like a mile repeat at 5 45 but I like was like it felt like jogging so I just know that if I like train specifically for it I could do so much faster but um but that's a long ways off right now but I, I love running I love setting the big goals and they don't like it doesn't stress me out how far away I am I just get so excited by like all the things I can do to tackle it you know and I absolutely I, I love that so much like you make me excited about my goals because you, you kind of hit the nail on the head like it's it's miles away it's huge yeah. you're nowhere yeah. near, I'm nowhere near where I want to be in just a few months yet yeah. so when I'm doing my runs I'm like oh you know yeah I'm a long way off but the yeah. the thought of the journey trying to chip that time down and knowing that if I put the work in it will show in in, in my speed or whatever it's exciting it's like it it really, really will. It like, it's, it's all going to pay off. Everything you're doing is like investments. It's going to pay off. And like I told you, like for, for my 311, every easy run was done at 10 to 12 minute pace. So like, even when you're running slow, then just tell yourself like, oh, I'm doing this. So I can run a Boston qualifying time. Like I'm running so easy right now. So that way on my speed day, I can go so hard. And like, it's that big pace differential that you need to see a lot of progress. 
Like if you want to see a little progress, then run hard on your easy days and run mediocre on your hard days. <laughs> but if you want to see a big, like a, a lot of progress, you just need to run like majorly easy on your, on your easy runs and then just go, go hard on your hard days. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a takeaway message is easy is easy. Yeah. With whatever easy feels like to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I do think the message is starting to get through with, with athletes. Um, yeah. But if we keep talking about it and making people aware and yeah. normalizing, a vet, you know, a very slow pace. I mean, I think it, Elliot does his easy miles at something like 9, 30 minute miling, 10 minute miling, something like that. So if it's, if it's good enough for Elliot, it's good enough exactly. for the rest of us. Exactly. And then we have people who are like, their their race pace is like nine minute pace and they're still running nine minute pace for their easy days and you're like no <laughs> yeah absolutely but i'm laughing because i've been there yeah <laughs> i know I, I, went to yeah. A, I went to a race with my friends and like she was trying to break two hours in the marathon that day and i think i was going for like i was trying to break 90 minutes that day and we're like running to the race and so we're warming up together going to the race she's like you're going so slow how can you run this slow and i'm like this is how I warm up and run all my easy runs. She's like, I don't know how you can run this slow. And I'm like, yeah, you run slow to go fast, you know? Yeah, and so it was just like funny to me, like, cause her, all of her paces were basically all the same, whether she was easy running or race pacing. And for me, I just like, my slow is like, like too slow for somebody who's running a, yeah. uh, a two hour, sub two hour marathon. And um, it, it's just like funny, you know, but I think the more you can embrace easy, the better off you'll be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when is the 311, um, the sub three goal? Have you got a rough date, rough time when you'd like to get that by? Um, not really since it seemed like everything is still so up in the air, you know, with yeah. all this, it's hard to like, I would love to run it at CIM. So I was just telling my friend the other day, like, I don't, I, I, I don't know if I see, um, California international marathon or any big marathons actually happening in 21. I just. I would love for that to happen. I just don't know if it's feasible. Um, but, you know, maybe 2022, um, getting to run it then. Uh, but, you know, I I think virtual marathons are great, but that's not something I would do just because um, I would want it to be able to count, you know, since I only do one marathon every couple of years at this point, I'm like, it needs to be official with everyone, you know? So uh, I would, I think probably CIM uh, 2022 is probably when I'll do my next marathon, unless they have one this year. So if they do, then pending. <laughs> it, it is hard though, because everything is so up in the air. I mean, all the spring marathons have been canceled here, which was kind of obvious. Um, yeah. The autumn at the moment is lockdown, right? Yeah. So I think we're going to be in lockdown until Easter, maybe, which is yeah. quite a way away. Um, and then you've obviously got trying to come back into some normal functioning of society without big, yeah. big, big races. Yeah. Um, but I guess it's quite a lot to go through marathon cycles and marathon training blocks with the uncertainty of will this race happen? Will it not? I mean, you don't yeah. use the training, but it's a lot to invest to then have your race cancelled or yeah. changed. I think that that's why this is a really helpful time to just focus on speed for a lot of people. Like, um, I don't switch to marathon training until like right when I'm doing a marathon, because I found for me and my body that it's really tiring and I don't even like to spend that many, that long training for a marathon. So I'll just do an eight to 10 week block of marathon specific training. But other than that, I like to train for speed. It's just a lot easier on your body. It keeps you fresher. Um, it's more fun, but so I think now is a great time for people to just work on their speed and then once we actually know that races are coming up, then we can switch in those last 10 weeks to just marathon specific work, but you'll be going into it fit, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's my plan this year is to start marathon specific stuff. Once I know that actually it probably is on. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, what, what are you guys supposed to be doing? Um, well, I've got a couple of options. Uh, uh, ooh, either Manchester or Abingdon here in the UK, which... Okay may or may not be on um i was tempted by the chicago ballot but um yeah we shall see i don't know i think i've gotten is it to the end of the month to register so i was supposed to run chicago twice before um oh, really? i had a stress fracture both times 
Oh no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is my previous self where I was kind of going a little bit silly yeah. and just yeah. like I said to you, I'd go into a calorie deficit and I'd do all these yeah. miles and then I'd oh I'm broke. Yeah. Um, How did this yeah. happen? <laughs> <laughs> Two years in a row. Oh um, my god. I'm dead. I'm not entering Chicago again. It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> like jinxed <laughs> yeah but we should see we should see there's no rush I mean at the moment for me I'm just getting back into the swing of things and uh, yeah you know, like you building up and just doing it the right way hopefully um but yeah it's all yeah. good stuff you're in such a fun phase though because aiming for Boston and there's honestly like nothing like it and you know in, in getting that BQ it's like such a special time so I think you just have to know like you're going to do it it's like totally going to happen. It's inevitable. And then just train like you believe that, you know, and that makes it a lot more fun, like training, like, you know, you're going to get it. And so you just have to like put in the work versus like already uh, versus putting too much pressure on yourself and just feeling like you're always not doing enough. So just train like you already think you're getting it, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I, I really hope that there's lots of people that watch this that take that away with whatever their goals are. Yeah. Train like you are going to do it. That yeah, you have that potential and you can achieve it. Yeah, like like you're the one who already knows the secret, even if nobody else does. So like you know the secret that like you're gonna do it, and so like you're just gonna like keep working to like show everybody. But like you already know, like it's already happening, you know. And so like that's how I like try to think about things, and then they end up they happen because I already like so believe they're gonna happen. I love that. I'm, I feel like I'm going to be going around on my easy runs now with like a little smile on my face thinking, yeah, I know something you don't know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then when you're on your easy runs, just like see yourself in your mind, just like running so fast and like strong and just feeling like so strong when you're running, like, because that's what I do. Like I'll be running 11 minute, 12 minute pace. And I'll be like watching myself in my mind running so easy at six minute pace. And I'll be like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I, I'm able to do that while running super slow because I just really believe in my potential. You know, that's what we all have to do. Like, yeah, I love it. Uh, I've absolutely, I could, I could probably chat to you for a lot longer about a lot more different things because I, I absolutely love it. But hopefully I will put all of your links below because I do hope that people go and check you out on Instagram, especially because like I said, you do say it how it is and uh, you share your experiences. Awesome. Thank you so much for letting me come on and, and oh, chat. Pleasure. I, I'm so excited to follow your BQ journey um, because this is totally inevitable and exciting. And so, um, yeah, um, thank you so much for like letting me chat with you. This is so fun. No, I've absolutely loved chatting with you. And thank you so much for taking the time. I will let you go and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. It is Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. Yes, it's Sunday. And it's not raining, which is great. So. Oh, well, we've had snow here today, which has been great fun. But um, no. it's British, so it's a sprinkling of snow and the whole world stops and we can't yeah. go outside. <laughs> I love it. Well, enjoy it. And I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Bye. I really hope that you enjoyed hearing from Kimberly today. Please do make sure to go and give her a follow. I will pop her links below. That's it for this week. I will be back next week with another interview. But until then, stay safe and happy running. <laughs>